I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about um, the race and race video speaks a lot to the issues of, of poverty and, and issues of the gross inadequacy of social assistance. I, I may refer to some of those things in passing, but in the in what I was going to talk about, I wanted to bring the perspective that uh, that we that we're developing around the bigger question of the agenda of austerity and and, and resistance to it. Um, the truth is that, um, that since 2008, when, uh, when the financial crisis broke and then became an economic crisis and then metamorphosized into a debt crisis and continues to, continues to sweep through the world, um, the, uh, the, the, the level of attack has clearly and obviously gone up and is only just beginning to, uh, to intensify. Um, it has produced um, it has produced an incredible array of cutbacks and attacks internationally. Um, the International Monetary Fund has called for 20 years of austerity, um, and that's a sobering, terrifying perspective. Uh, the G20 gathering that took place in Toronto so recently was focused on the question of austerity, and it needs to be said that, uh, that the Canadian government stood on the right of the, uh, of the gathering in terms of what was being proposed and what was being, uh, what was being developed. And uh, I come here from Toronto, uh, where we see uh, a municipal administration that is moving into totally unprecedented areas of, of, of attack, dismantling services, um, preparing attacks on city workers, uh, on a scale and uh, a level that is that is completely unheard of in uh, in recent history, and so clearly the rules of the game are changing, and we can look to the the situation in uh, in Canada, uh, but if we look overseas, we look at Greece, we see the the full enormity of the austerity agenda as it's being as it's being developed and as it's being played out. Quite clearly, in Greece, uh, while there is very significant and important resistance emerging that's inspiring. The attack is uh, the attack is continuing, and they're quite prepared uh, to uh, to ensure that the uh, debt interest payments to a uh, a bar full of uh, financiers uh, carries on, even if it means people lose their pensions, that, uh, unemployment goes through the roof. I mean, clearly the clearly the level of attack is uh, is, is enormous. I want to try to bring a perspective with regards to this austerity agenda and where it comes from. Um, because it isn't, uh, it isn't just simply that, uh, that some governments decided it would be better to attack people than to, uh, than to have any level of social consensus. Uh, certainly, the, the agenda of austerity is being developed. It is, being, it is a conscious, very definite strategy that's being pursued. But I think it's important to say as well that it does come out of an actual condition of crisis that has emerged within the system. It isn't, in that sense, a choice. It's an actual, uh, it's an actual product of uh, of a crisis that has emerged. And if you look at, if you look at, if you look back historically, uh, the agenda of austerity emerges out of a out of a lengthy period of uh, of, uh, of history. Um, at the end of the Second World War, um, there were uh, there was a huge upsurge. There was enormous resistance. The uh, the unemployed movements of the 1930s had had a considerable impact in terms of laying the groundwork for, uh, for, uh, for, for uh, social improvements. But uh, in the period after the Second World War, there was a really major upsurge of trade union organizing, certainly in this country and in other countries. And it was enormous and it was profound and it had a, it had a real impact on society. Um, what emerged in the period after the Second World War playing out in different countries in different ways was essentially a strategy on the part of those in economic and political power to make tactical concessions, to, 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 to make a, a, a retreat, a tactical retreat in the face of that, in the face of that upsurge. And what emerged uh, here, and, in, and you, can, you can look at comparable arrangements in at least the historically privileged countries, um, was a, a kind of a de facto post-war settlement. Um, and a definite set of arrangements were put, in, were put into, a, into effect. There was an agreement that trade unions would be recognized and that trade unions would be dealt with. And that wasn't a given in Canadian history. 
as anyone knows who's looked into it, uh, when unions first organized, they were treated in law as criminal conspiracies. Uh, the act of trying to collectively bargain with, a, with uh, an employer was a crime. And for a lengthy period, in practice, unions were not recognized. But in the, in the post-war period, they were. And uh, there was a, an edifice of labor relations legislation. And, and corresponding to that, there were incremental improvements in what could be called the social wage, the social programs. And that whole period uh, during the, uh, the years of the post-war boom was marked by a process of, of improvement. Uh, the, the other side of the arrangement, however, was that on our side, there had to be an agreement that the level of resistance would be kept within certain management levels. Um, that there wouldn't be that there wouldn't be uh, general strikes. There would be strikes. Uh, there would be strikes around collective agreements. That the that, that things would be kept within certain levels. And that arrangement during the post-war years uh, brought very definite benefits to uh, to people. It stabilised the system, that's for sure. But it also it also resulted in uh, in, uh, in improvements in living standards and uh, and such like. Um, however, at the end of the uh, approximately, let's say, the end of the 1970s, um, there was significantly a falling rate of profit. There were really pro major problems within the system. And uh, what uh, took place was the development of a new strategy uh, that has become known as neoliberalism. And the basic plan was to take back the, uh, the gains of an earlier period. And that's certainly true. Levels of uh, of trade union uh, levels of trade union membership were, were in decline. Uh, much harder responses came to the efforts of unions to win improvements for their uh, for their members, uh, and a process of cutting back social programs took place. That's true of all social programs, but it was especially true of those social programs that dealt with income support, by which I mean unemployment insurance and uh, and, and and welfare. Uh, Chicago economists in the 1970s, in 1974 actually, uh, writing on the question of, uh, of why it was that during uh, a recession, when unemployment w was at levels higher than it had been at any time since the, uh, since the 1930s, that wages were not coming down. And uh, they, wrote, they wrote these words. They said that uh, unemployment insurance and welfare have made unemployment insufficiently terrifying. And, uh, and that strategy was certainly something that uh, I, I'm sure he didn't read much in the way of, uh, of uh, Chicago economist. In fact, he didn't read any books. He acknowledged that. But Mike Harris, nonetheless, uh, Mike Harris, nonetheless, uh, understood very clearly the logic of that position, and his cut to social assistance was all about uh, was all about that. 